So, classical music. The ballroom music for people in tuxedos and frilly dresses. And the background music for super villains. Or maybe something that your grandmother rocks to with like a CD or a gramophone. I am a classical music lover and I am your average high schooler struggling with grades and university applications. So, very obviously I am very far away from the stereotypes that I just described. So, I am a little bit personally offended every time every, um, some people dismiss my passion for classical music as obsolete or old. But the classical music industry is making itself obsolete. Oh shoot, my bad. Um, shameless self-plug, I co-founded a blog called Freddie Debussy in order to get in touch with prestigious musicians across North America within the classical music, music industry. And I've learned very valuable lessons from them by interviewing them, but these are a few of my takeaways. So first of all, let's look at the representation of classical music today. So look at all of those faces. You might be familiar, familiar with some of them, and they are the main players in today's orchestral repertoire, and you hear them at virtually every single concert. But you can't look at those faces and tell me that they represent our demographic right now. I mean, most of us in the audience today look different from all of them. And frankly, you're probably quite tired of hearing Beethoven getting rejected by Elise time and time again with Fur Elise. And so, Modern classical music that tell our stories do exist. So for example, one Mexican composer I've interviewed wrote a piece inspired by his experiences of eating spicy foods. An Asian composer was inspired by his cultural heritage to compose a piece based on the legend of a dragon. Several composers wrote about how things in nature communicate with each other and use that, and use that as an urge for people to care about climate change. And also, one composer I've interviewed was inspired by a very long German word to write a piece inspired by the interior smell of his new car. And so, to everyone wondering whether classical music is dead, classical music is alive, and it, there are still very beautiful music being produced that tell our story, but we just don't hear about them as often. So the ways that the orchestra dealt with this underrepresentation is to start programming those pieces into their concerts. However, they would quite literally stash these pieces and squish them at the beginning of a concert to quickly move on to the bulk of the concert, which is the classical canons. And so this way, orchestras check out the box for diversity and inclusion because technically they have included pieces by a wide demographic, demographic of composers, however long these pieces are. And so composers I've interviewed would literally receive commissions for two to three minute pieces, and then their commission funds would be deducted if they go over time. So to visualize it better, it's college application season in 2024, and imagine you have to squeeze everything you have to say about a prompt within 50 words. Isn't that like very infuriating? And this is the classical music industry we're dealing with right now. Orchestras use these composers as tools to check off boxes for diversity and inclusion so they would get recognition and praise for being progressive and inclusive. And then they would use this praise to further fuel their performances of the classical canons. So this is why the classical music industry is so exclusive, because even its inclusive efforts are to ultimately mask its exclusive nature. And I also want to touch on a very common phenomenon within the classical music community. So let's use myself as an example. So um, I, on the one hand, try to promote, try to promote classical music on every single media I can think of and try to portray the narrative as a very welcoming person. So classical music lovers are very relevant to society as opposed to what you might think. And we are very welcoming, we are very nice, we tolerate different music tastes. It's totally okay if you don't know anything about classical music. Just please give this genre a try because we are very nice people. But then, on the other hand, I have also hissed at fellow audience members for not following concert conventions such as clapping between movements. And I might have publicly dissed pop music as pop trash because I thought my musical taste was superior since I was smart enough to appreciate the more complex harmonies of classical music. 
supposedly. So if any of that felt personal, I swear I have changed because I was very naive and young. But this is another example of how exclusivity is masked by inclusiveness in, classroom, in the classical music industry. So, so many organizations in classical music try to seem welcoming to lure you into their community just to be greeted, just for you or classical muse to be greeted by hypocrites and elitists like I was, and for you to be judged by not following concert conventions that are frankly quite culty, and to also convince you that classical music is superior. And so this is why the classical music industry is obsolete. Not because of its music, but because of its practices. Lip service, pretense, and stubborn rules. So why am I talking about this? And how, is, how does this correlate with our theme today? And why, does it, why is it relevant to us? So I hope this is not like an awkward transition like the end of my English essays often are. But if you think about it, this the classical music industry really leads us to reflect on our positions regarding change and inclusivity. So nowadays, industries, institutions, and individuals try to change themselves for the better by disrupting certain aspects of the reality around them. But in truth, how much of those disruptions are really authentic? So take classical music, for example. They're making noticeable changes in their industry just to ultimately mask their stubbornness against change and fuel that. So if we reflect upon that ourselves, how much are our change actually for the better? And how much are our change to mask and fuel our resistance to change? And how much are we changing to benefit our ideals instead of the ideals of the collective? So the classical music industry focuses, or really leads us to focus, on disruption. But if we truly want to see change, I don't, I don't even think that we can call them disruptions. Because it's only when these disruptions become a norm, rather than a noticeable publicity stunt, that is when we have truly reached a point of change. Thank you.